Namaste all. Welcome back everyone to Ripples in the Sand. This podcast is brought to you by the folks at Drifting Sands Haibun, where we invite Haibun poets who have appeared in the journal to both read and discuss their poetry. This is your host Sangeeta Kalarikal. To our regular listeners as ever, thank you for supporting us. I uh, hope you have subscribed to our YouTube channel. Hit the notification button so that you won't miss out on our activities. Please like, love, comment and spread the word of Haikai poetry to your friends. My guest this episode hails from Baxley, Georgia, an author and a haiku poet. His haiku have been published for the past 20 years in top journals. He has won several awards including this year the Itoeni Oi Ocha New Haiku Contest in Japan and the Little Iris Haiku Contest in Croatia. He took over the duties of social media coordinator for the Haiku Society of America in 2022. For his day job, he's a freelance copy editor, and with an impressive voice, as you will soon hear, he's a radio DJ for South Georgia broadcasters. Folks, please extend a warm welcome to Edward Cody Huddleston. Welcome, Edward, to Ripples in the Sand. Um, as I understand, you are a radio DJ. Uh, in your Yes, I am. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I was wondering what kind of music do you uh, play on the radio? We have um two stations. One of them is contemporary country music. So, mm. um uh Jason Aldean, uh Luke Bryan, those kinds of guys. Mm-hmm. And then we mm-hmm. have a uh, greatest hits station with an emphasis on 80s rock so you'll hear Ooh. Michael Jackson it'll go into REM <laughs> it'll go into Prince and then there'll be some Journey and okay. um you know every Friday at 5 we play working for the weekend so you know <laughs> all that stuff and that's the one I do my show on cuz I'm a bigger fan of the 80s okay wonderful uh you know I'm from Minnesota and uh, this is Prince country you know we love yeah. Prince The late great yeah. prince he passed away the week I started working in radio. Oh, really? So that was a shock. I was like sitting there at my oh desk my reading it. I'm like, "No. No." So I oh, was very wow. and Prince was just a very talented individual. He played oh, every absolutely. instrument. His deep yeah. cuts on his albums were so good. You know, it's like yeah. a lot of artists yeah. they've got two or three really good songs on an album and the rest is yeah. they needed to fill it out so they could sell it. Not prince, prince like made everything great. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. yep. Yeah, his uh, his uh, house is pretty nearby actually to where I live and you know it's it's like a shrine. Yeah. For a lot of people. They do people. that with certain greats like you know um our first presidents, you know, there's like the mm-hmm. Abraham Lincoln house, um mm-hmm. Prince Nick Virgilio. It's really cool that they preserve those. Yeah, I I I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah, I was wondering what is the one thing you like about DJing and does that relate to or affect your poetry in any way? I do like performing. I like kind of being in front of people. When I was younger, I had a lot of social anxiety, so I feel like maybe I'm compensating for that or I just felt the the <laughs> need to okay, I'm not going to feel like this my entire life and the way out is through, you know, whenever you're if you have any kind of a phobia, the treatment to it is to expose yourself to it gradually. So I started mm-hmm. doing community theater. and um then uh, actually it was around that time i met the uh the president of the radio station and we reconnected later and he asked me to come work for him and i worked my way up from an intern to my job title now is production director oh. so i write voice and produce commercials all day and um i started writing poetry i think it was late 2012 i was at a library and there was a a book in the poetry section that was about the fall out of the stacks and I don't know if this was coincidence or if this was fate or whatever but I pushed it back and then I kind of stopped and looked at the title and it was um the Japanese haiku it's essential nature history and possibilities in english by Kenneth Yatsuda mm. and that's kind of where I started with haiku and that was before I was even working in radio so I guess the need to perform and everybody wants to feel heard you know and haiku yeah. um is a really good outlet for that and I feel like haiku yeah. is a very 
calming. You know what I mean? I feel yes. like it's the most therapeutic yeah. form of art. You know, I listen yeah. to music and I write haiku, and those are kind of my two forms of therapy. Yeah, you started very young writing haiku. Yeah, I was um, 19 about to turn yes. 20, and now I'm 30, yeah. so I've been writing my entire 20s. <laughs> wow. Oh, so writing haiku is, uh, is it, it is, I mean, poetry is therapeutic. It is mm. therapeutic so far, I think so. Yeah. Um, so the first poem you have for us was published in Drifting Sands High Uh Would you like to talk a little bit about it before you read Right in the Feelings? Yes. Um, right in the Feelings is a very nostalgic hybun, and I write from nostalgia a lot, and I notice I do it more and more the older I get, so hopefully it won't get to where it's 100% <laughs> nostalgia. But um, <laughs> life's a lot simpler when you're a kid, and I had, you know, nobody's life is perfect, but I'd say I had a happy childhood, so it's natural to, you know, be stressed at work and be like, man, I remember when just, you know, beating uh -huh. that Mega Man game was the biggest thing in my life. That was pretty cool, you know. <laughs> You know, when you're a kid, you think of all the stuff you can't do, but you don't yeah. think of the stuff that you're going to have to do later. That's so, right. you know, the grass is always <laughs> greener, you know, and not just spatially, yeah. but temporally as well. So yeah. um, I used to love the Scholastic Book Fair and this um, Haibun is all about that. Are you ready for me to read it? Yes, please. Right in the feelings. You wake up at your desk. You're in the third grade. The concepts of social media, social unrest, pandemics, and war crimes all fade into a haze. Today is the Scholastic Book Fair, and your mom gave you $25. Have a great day, kiddo. Folding spring into summer. Paper plane. Beautiful. You know, I, I love the uh, time travel in this high one. It's uh... It's that's what it feels like, because sometimes the times we live in cause so much trauma mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah, like you said, we wish to go back to a time when terror of these factors is not so intense um, or different. I, I love the the haiku is so beautifully connected, but different enough. Uh, so this is this is a beautiful uh, piece to start off our uh, session today. Um, and your next Taibun also touches on the outlook to difficulties in life, Intrusive Thoughts. Uh, it was published in Contemporary Haibun Online. Uh, was there something you would like our listeners to know about it uh, before you read it? Well, um, a lot of people have intrusive thoughts and I have obsessive compulsive disorder and that's pretty much defined by intrusive thoughts. I have what's mm -hmm. called pure OCD, so I have a lot of just... Mm -hmm um invasive intrusive thoughts a lot of the time and actually haikus helped me with that and so has meditation oh. so has wim hof breathing you know there you learn mm -hmm. the tricks you learn how to negotiate how to yes. negotiate with your illness so to yeah. speak and yeah. this is sort of about that but mm -hmm. um you know it's a little i would say it's sad but it's not it's the if once you get to the ending it's a very short high but my high do tend yes. to be very brief so there's yeah. the 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 shadow and there's the light contrasting with yeah. each other Intrusive yes. thoughts. Saying that life is pain is like saying that the sky is blue. You're right, but there's still so much light to be seen. My inner monologue becomes a dialogue. Paxil Moon. Wow. Uh, actually, your li line three in the haiku really made me smile. Uh, Paxil is a medication for depression. Is that... Am I right? Uh, yes, and it's used for obsessive uh, compulsive disorder as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then suddenly the phrase in your haiku, uh, my inner monologue becomes a dialogue, really shines. The last line really makes it shine. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful haiku. Um, and you've written both these haiku in second person. So what made you choose that? It felt like I could speak sort of directly to the reader and also kind of made it sort of I'm, I'm speaking. I'm literally speaking or writing to myself when I write these because it's just me looking at them, you know, because I'm alone in a room writing them. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. the narrator speaking to the narrator and the narrator speaking to the audience. And um, it's one of those things where I think I initially wrote um, writing the feelings in the first person 
but it just felt like uh-huh. it worked better when I rewrote it in the second person. And Intrusive Thoughts was always in the second person because yeah. it kind of reads like a conversation. It's like, well, yes. it sounds like you're responding to someone who's talking about how painful life is. And it is. It can be very, yeah. very difficult, but there's yeah. the beautiful parts of it as well. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, personally, I'm when I write stories, I prefer not to write in second person and I'm a little bit the same. But in these two uh, pieces, it works so well. Uh, yeah, uh, the fact that you're addressing the reader, it, it that's, that's what makes these high bone shine. I appreciate so, that. Um, I feel like if they were longer, it wouldn't work because it'd start to be grading where you'd feel mm-hmm. like I'm telling you what to do and how to feel. But mm-hmm. since the high bone, the, the prose of the high bone is so brief that I, I it kind of allows me to get away with it in a way that I wouldn't if they were longer pieces. Yeah, you, you're you're absolutely right. I just realized that. I just realized that. That's, that's right. Mm, now, you have a new book out, uh, right? And this is a haiku book, Bottling Honey. Yes. Um, uh, what that is, it's a little bit unique, especially in the haiku world, where uh, most things come from one of the big presses, like, you know, either you do it with um, Red Moon Press or mm-hmm. Bottle Rockets Press or something like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. This is, um, there was a publisher, um, Dragon Soul Press, and they had this thing, Soul Ink Anthology Volume 1. They were taking any kind of poetry, but your submission has to be more than 1,000 words. And they even said they would take haiku, but you know, all the rules for how long it had to be still applied. And I was like, wow, a thousand words of haiku. Nobody <laughs> would be crazy enough to send them that. And you know, I have this massive Google doc with metric tons of things that I've written. And I spent, I had about, I had a very rare day where I had nothing planned and it's always going to be a Saturday if I have nothing going on. And I spent about 16 hours that day rooting through old poems that I, that I, I, that I still believed in but I hadn't found a home for yet. And I've been a lot more prolific over the last few years. So it's like, well, even though I just published my last collection, Wildflowers in a Vase Mm -hmm. in um, late 2021, yeah, it's with Red Moon Press, really happy with how that collection turned out. It's about 80 haiku. I decided, well, let me send them this and I can, if they take it, I can frame it as kind of another collection of just totally previously unpublished poems. And they took it. So that's Mm -hmm. my largest collection now because I this has 113 previously unpublished poems because that's what it took oh, me wow. to get a little over a thousand words I think it's a thousand forty words or something along oh those lines. okay and you um, made it yep and you can get the one one good thing about doing something like this you can get the ebook version on Amazon super cheap like two or three dollars I think or you can get mm-hmm. a print version for I think 20 and it comes with of course all the other poets who I'm sure wrote really good stuff in the collection. Oh, I've been very be nice haiku focused lately, so I haven't really paid attention to the <laughs> the other stuff. But okay. yeah, okay. Wonderful. And I do have a few poems from that collection I'd like to share with you. Yes, please. So here are some new poems from Bottling Honey, and these are just haiku. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Chasing rainbows, the child asks for a bigger net. Lone cricket, tuning the silence. Dandelion sun, maybe there's something out there wishing upon us. A storm before the storm, cloudy coffee. Spring chill, autocomplete puts trauma after childhood. Blank to-do list, the slowness of clouds. Dad's harmonica. Harping on spring. Earn lid moon, the weight of emptiness. And the last one I have to share here is winter night, we finish each other's constellations. These are so well woven and poignant. Um, I'm just surprised that it didn't take get taken, snapped up before this. Uh, uh, this book collection. Well, thank you. Some of them I don't think I ever really sent anywhere, and some of them I substantially yeah. revised because they might have been written when I had a very different level of maturity in the genre. 
So right. a lot of them, I'm really glad they didn't get accepted because it would have been a bad version. And then I wouldn't be able to publish the better version because I'd be, you know, sort of violating my own copyright. <laughs> so, oh, uh, you know, I think we poets are always, always evolving, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in this list, I especially like the um, Winter Night we finish each other's constellation. L3 was so unexpected in this coup. I mean, uh, to me, it talks about an involvement of two people that's written in the stars. I don't know about Yeah, what that's what I was intended. going for, exactly <laughs> that. And um, you know, you can hear of, we're so in love with each other, we finish each other's. And then the, the other person says, oh, sentences? So I was like, I'm gonna subvert that, you know? Winter night, we finish each other's constellations. Beautiful, beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Ah, <laughs> oh, so beautiful. Well, thank you. Um, shall we go ahead with a high one? Uh, I think the next one, a uh, spelling lesson. Yes. Uh, this was published in Contemporary High uh, Online, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, spelling lesson. The little girl is too young to spell happy, so, sh so she draws her mom and dad. In the corner, there's something that might be a butterfly or a sun, or maybe it's just scribbles, but somehow it ties the whole thing together. Salad skies. All the languages. I don't speak. This is brilliant. Uh, here you have the sun and the butterfly that are the artistic synonyms of uh, happiness. And uh, I absolutely love how you've described skies, solid skies. And so in my mind, I'm seeing st stunning sunsets, you know, when there are so many different colors in the sky. What was your idea? Well, um, Shakespeare said salad days. So I was kind of thinking salad skies. Mm -hmm. And um, when you have a salad, you have all the ingredients kind of just chopped up and thrown together. So that feels like how every language is kind of a composite of other languages until you go far back to the proto languages 10 plus thousand years ago. And when you're a kid, everything's kind of, um, everything's kind of like new snow. You don't have any preconceptions. Mm -hmm. You're so much mm -hmm. more mentally fresh and, you know, you draw things that are the wrong color, but why is it the wrong color? You're just taking artistic liberties. And I sort of took artistic liberties because this is a fictional poem. There was no real little girl. It just kind of was born out of um, mm -hmm. just, I used to work in a library and there would be kids drawing and things like that. And a lot of it would be just, um, you know, coloring and just doing arts and crafts with their parents. We had story time every week. And so I would read books to them, uh, picture books and just, um, and even remembering when I was little, when I was in like lollipop school, we called it when I was four. So it just sort of <laughs> took elements from all those things. And um, much like the little girl, I just kind of threw it all together. Yeah, it's it's just beautiful. It's beautiful. Uh, so Edward, you know, when you write, what, what, where do you get your inspiration from? Do you go for walks? Do you, um, you know, or just life I, or stories you hear? All of the above for sure. Um, there's a big emphasis on um, just sort of clearing my mind before I write. And um, the first thing I do in the morning is meditate and clear my mind. I do deep breathing. And that's sort of, um, you know, if I start the day on the right foot, it's easier to get into that headspace where it's possible to be creative. And mm -hmm. I, I usually, every day I go over what I wrote in the days prior and then I see if I can improve anything and I see if I have any ideas for just writing something new. Cause sometimes I'll wake up with a line or just some kind of an idea. So I write a lot early in the day, but sometimes, you know, it's the end of the day I got home from work and, you know, my blood pressure is dropping like it does when you come home from work and, you know, I just had dinner and maybe a little bit of wine with dinner, you know, or for dessert yeah. and uh, <laughs> start uh, getting more creative and, you know, tends to happen then and I do go for walks um not at this time of year because I live in South Georgia and it's like walking oh through my napalm god. oh my god and, you know we had um Crazy. there were several year. days where we had a heat index of over 110 I think it broke 115 yep. a few times so my gosh yeah yeah I'm yeah. not going out yeah my um my dog I have a miniature schnauzer he usually loves to go on 
walks and you know just around the yard i don't take him on the asphalt where he would burn his little paws <laughs> but he just yeah. wants to go out and back in no matter who's taking him out he's like out back in well he knows yeah he, he knows. knows he it's knows just, it's <laughs> It's just way too hot. Yeah, this this yeah. year is this El Nino has really mm. caused havoc all over the world. That's so true. Oh, yeah. And um, sometimes I I'll be reading something and it'll give me an idea for just a key go or just a way of oh I didn't know I could do that in haiku that's a good idea and I'll just make a mental note of it. And so when I read, I feel like I'm um putting more arrows in my quiver that I can kind of, you know, shoot at a target later on mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it'll remind me. And I like to read um, haiku poets who write a lot differently than I do mm. because mm -hmm. um, the, I, it'll give me an idea of, well, I would do this totally differently on the one hand. And on the other hand, it'll be like, wow, I never would have thought to do it like that. That's brilliant. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, whether, yeah. you know, it's, it, it comes it, whether I interpret it as well. That's not the way I do it, or I interpret it as oh, that's something brilliant. It either way it gets me to kind of think of haiku in a way that I perhaps wouldn't if I were just reading people whose styles were more similar to mine. Not that this... style necessarily matters as much with haiku as with other genres, but you know if you're reading um, like Fay a Yogi, and then you go to read um, Paul Miller, they're both really really good. But you can yeah, tell who's you can tell which one is which easily. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, so, style of writing and uh, on on the art of writing, right? You have the next uh, next one, next haigun, a semi-automatic writing. Yes, uh, and that's yeah, sort of a that, playoff that was... of um, the phrase automatic writing. So yeah. Uh, this makes a lot of, um, it, you know, it's so contemporary in the sense of um, uh, we are going into a lot of people have just given chat GPT and such stuff um, a try, right? Yeah, and I did write <laughs> so, this before chat GPT existed, I'm pretty uh, sure. So, uh, you, but. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Technology is changing everything. And obviously, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. even the way that I tend to, you know, use Microsoft Word and Google Docs, that's not something that people were doing, you know, because a lot of the great haiku poets now, they were writing when I was born or before I was born. So they were just doing right. a pad and paper and maybe a typewriter. Right. Right. And right. they might have had an old Apple and a dial-up connection with a screeching modem. <laughs> that would be much recently, right? Yeah, even I that's mean, relatively yeah. recent. Yeah, but, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. All right. Semi-automatic yep. writing. Mm -hmm. I have a file on my desktop titled hyphen dot docx. Sometimes it's a grocery list. Sometimes it's a diary. Sometimes I bang out a dozen haiku in it before breakfast. Sometimes I can't describe what I'm writing in it. It just makes me feel better. Every Sunday night, I hit control A delete and start it over. It always makes me feel cleansed after. Stars starting where words end. Lovely, lovely. And this was published in Contemporary Highbone Online, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so when I first read this Highbone, the thing that came into my mind was, is like a uh, parking lot. You know, so your document is a space where you park your thoughts, and then you say you erase what you poured out. <laughs> uh, does that mean that you what you think and create is gone forever? I mean, what does this uh -oh. say about your creative process? Or does it? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I keep the haiku. If there's something that's, if or if I have a line that I think will be good for a free verse poem or a short story okay. or something else, okay. or sometimes it'll be a bit to talk about on the radio, I'll uh -huh. save it in its appropriate place, but I always purge the document. Sometimes I'll just sort of, you know, air out my feelings for the day. And just kind of vent okay. a little bit. And sometimes it really will just be a grocery list or it'll be a list of chores. Like, okay, after work, I have to go here, here, and here. And it'll uh -huh. just be a, kind of like a scratch pad that's whatever. <laughs> you don't know. That might uh, end up being a Torio Vase, right? <laughs> <laughs> it could be anything. <laughs> Oh wow, that that was beautiful. Uh, hey, so I was wondering, you see, you're basically a haiku poet. Uh, why haibun? Yeah, I emphasize haiku a lot. I probably yeah. um, 
what I write is probably, if I had to think about it, it's probably uh, 97% haiku, 2% free mm-hmm. verse, and 1% haiku adjacent forms if I'm talking about poetry. Because, uh-huh. um, you know, uh-huh. I write a lot at my yeah. job. I write, you know, things I'm going to talk about on the air. I write out, you know, bits for that. I write a lot of right. copy. Um, right. I do freelance copy editing. So that involves a little bit of writing and, you know, things yeah. like that. Um, so I've probably written fewer Hyben than a lot of people interviewed for this podcast, but I do love reading them. In fact, I read Hyben pretty religiously because I, I enjoy <laughs> it so much because they still yeah. are brief. And I like the brevity because life's so busy yes. now. And when you've got mm-hmm. something that's, it's, I feel like Haibun tends to be the best of prose and the best of haiku because I feel like most haiku poets, if they were just writing prose, would be the kind of prose I want to read because mm-hmm. they tend to value the, um, the succinctness that goes along yeah. with haiku. So um, yeah. Terry French is the person whose Haibun sort of inspired me to write my own. And mm-hmm. I do want to write more Haibun and I've got some I'm workshopping and sending around. So I am working on them. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I want to write more Senryu and Tonka and Renge, but by default, uh, I, I really think in haiku a lot. You know, if people yeah, who yeah. speak different languages, they tend to think more in their mother tongue. Well, I think more in haiku. So that's kind of my mother tongue of poetry. <laughs> that's so beautiful. That's so beautiful. Well, thank you. So uh, about haibun, I have a question which I ask almost everybody. For you, what comes first, uh, haiku or the prose? Usually the prose. And then um, sometimes I'll take a haiku I've already written, and usually I'm, I change it. I change the, um, the fragment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But okay, um, I see. It does vary. It does vary. I think um, in the one I'm about to read, the last one I have here, which is the longest by far and the mm-hmm. strangest, it, the haiku for that I wrote first, and then I wrote the prose just by itself. It wasn't even meant to be a haibun, but then I thought, oh, I bet I could stick this with this and have that, you know? Okay. You know, sticks, meat, flint, here's fire. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's hear uh, Tower of Souls. All right, Tower of Souls. Every time I see it, it gets taller or I get closer. Light flows into it from all directions, pulling me closer, an inverted lighthouse. There are runes on the walls that spell the names of childhood dogs and classmates and grandparents. If a person is a collage of everyone they've met, it must follow that we're all at least a little dead inside. Vultures sit sentinel on spires watching me. I'm still too rare for them. I walk around the tower, cursing it in languages I don't speak, a personal tower of Babel. There's no door, no other obvious entrance. You just have to wait for the light to take you, preferably by leaving your soul under your pillow like a baby tooth. Today, I am the moth, low winter sun. This one is definitely a surreal poem. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking I feel... surreal when I wrote it. That was the same word that came to my mind. And it is based yeah. on a recurring dream I had several nights in a row. And I was like, okay, there must, I must oh, be supposed wow. to write something about this. So, you know, the way I look at it, it feels like more more like uh, philosophical. Every person carries within themselves the weight of their ancestors and the village, right? I mean, it mm-hmm. takes a village to raise a child that's oh, yeah. from that. Yeah. And that's my interpretation. And so, we're, all um, sort of the, we're all sort of all the people we've met before, but in our own way, mixed with our genetics and environment. And that's kind of a black box because mm-hmm. we can only look so deep back into that, you know. And I've, yeah. um, I've reread books from when I was a little kid, like dusting them out, like, okay, can I send this to Goodwill? Should I keep this for mm-hmm. when I have kids? Mm-hmm. Should I throw this away? And um, I've read phrases that I use all the time. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know that came from here. I never would have known that, you know, because it's just so embedded. We have these phrases yeah. we don't even know we use. So, um, yeah. you know, you just it becomes just so ingrained in who you are. And so many of our responses get so deeply conditioned in us that it's really it's it's something I think about a lot. And it's something that, um, you know, because all poetry kind of comes from the edge of the intellect where you kind of are going into the unknown, you know, instead of terra incognita, mm-hmm. it's like terra inco- incognita vita. <laughs> and, um, 
you know, so you're always kind of writing on the edge of yourself or you're not really writing. And you're, so you always have to kind of think on the edge of yourself or you're not really thinking. And this kind of came from that. And it's sort of, the, and you, when you mentioned the ancestors and the weight of, you know, who you are, that's exactly what I was going for when I wrote it. And that's okay. why I mentioned the runes and the walls and how, I, you know, I'm yeah, trying to yeah. get in, but I can't see deeply enough to see into it and I can't find a wow. way into it. So. Oh, wow. This is, this is so good. So good. Oh, um, yeah, well, uh, Edward, thank you so much for coming by and uh, reading uh, as your work. You know, I always believe that hearing the poem in the poet's voice is the best experience anybody could have. I mean, it's reading a poem is is uh, therapeutic in itself and beautiful, but hearing it read is just uh, phenomenal. So thank you so much, Edward, for coming by and giving us your time. Well, thank you so much. You did a lot of work to make this happen. And, you know, Drifting Sands <laughs> no. does a great thing. I'm glad there's another journal. You know, a lot of journals accept Hyben or are focused on Hyben, but I'm glad we have, well, there, not that many nowadays, though, you know, and I'm glad yeah, we have this true. relatively new one that's doing, you know, it's taking a lot of smart, creative risks. When I read Drifting Sands, yeah. I see poems that uh, take creative risks that pay off and it's not easy yes. to do that and it's not easy yes. to cultivate a journal that advances that so what you guys are doing is great i've listened to some of your Thank other you. podcasts and they're really well done i enjoyed i already mentioned terry french's name so you can probably tell she's one of my favorite poets but i oh, i've only listened to her fun. episode in its entirety i'm sure i'm going to go back and listen to the rest of them but um, <laughs> i really enjoyed that episode so thank you for everything you do thank with you. drifting thank sands you. and yeah as someone um, who you know my two my my bread is radio and my butter is haiku so this is kind of where the two meet audio and haiku <laughs> And oh, I feel like beautiful. we really, the world really needs more of this. And, you know, so I think it's great that this is going to yeah. be up there awesome. and out there for the world to kind of um, enjoy, fantastic. hopefully. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for supporting uh, Drifting Sands and, of course, being on Ripples in the Sand. But before we say bye, I was wondering if you could please read to us your haiku, two haiku, Dad's Harmonica and Earn lit moon one more time. I'm happy to do it. Dad's harmonica harping on spring. Earn lit moon the weight of emptiness. Wonderful. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Edward Cody Huddleston is the author of two haiku collections, first being Wildflowers in a Vase, published in 2021 by Red Moon Press. His recent book from which he read the haiku today is Bottling Honey, published in June this year. So that's fresh off the press uh, by Dragon Soul Press. It is available on Amazon in Kindle and print format. The music for Ripples in the Sand is from Grand Art Music. This podcast is produced by Richard Grant. This is Sangeeta Colorical signing off. Thank you for listening. <laughs>